Hello, everyone. Uh, appreciate folks who are here in person and joining online for our first speaker series event of the spring. Uh, really excited to be hosting this conversation between Nada Fete and Anika Collier Navaroli on the experiences of tech workers from marginalized backgrounds and the forms of community solidarity uh, between and across these, these tech companies. Um, and to quickly introduce Nada, who will be introducing our guest. Uh, Nutta is an employee fellow at the Institute for Rebooting Social Media. Uh, she holds BS and MS degrees from UC San Diego in computer science with a focus on systems and security. Uh, her background is in privacy and trust and safety, working most recently as a software engineer at Meta on messenger privacy and Instagram privacy teams. And during her time at the company, she was involved in various in integrity work streams, uh, escalating content moderation issues, and bringing awareness to bias in product features and enforcement systems. Um, we're looking forward to about 30 to 40 minutes of conversation between our two uh, wonderful, wonderful speakers today. Um, so please uh, put your questions in the chat uh, if you're joining via Zoom, and also just hold on to your questions if you're in the room. Um, but looking forward to audience participation at the end. And with that, I'll hand it over to Nada. Thank you for that introduction, Nick. Can everyone hear me? Great. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Anika Collier Navaroli who is a writer, lawyer, and researcher focused on the intersections of technology, media, policy, and human rights. She's currently a senior fellow at the Tao Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University, a Public Voices Fellow on Technology in the Public Interest with the Op-Ed Project in partnership with the MacArthur Foundation, and a 2023 Unicorn Fund awardee. Previously, she held senior policy official positions within trust and safety teams at Twitter and Twitch. And for the last decade, her work has spanned from inside tech companies and centers of research to advocacy organizations and classrooms. And so welcome. It's incredible to have you here, Anika. Um, so a brief background is that Anika and I actually met at RightsCon this past June and Good. instantly connected as ex-trust and safety workers at social media companies who are also deeply embedded within our own communities. Um, we reconnected the last few months as I was having a lot of conversations with previous colleagues and friends that are Palestinian, Muslim, and allies um, that have been observing a lot of biases and mistakes happening at the, uh, on these platforms at their companies, um, and sometimes um, internal hostile environments, and we're feeling unable to speak up. Uh, I can empathize and relate because I was in that position in 2021, um, but couldn't quite figure out what resources to point them to. Um, and what we could do constructively because there was no precedent set as to how to respond when these situations come up, um, especially when it gets bad. And so Anika was one of the first, first people that I reached out to and we realized that a lot of folks aren't really having these conversations in open spaces. And so we're excited to have this, uh, to start this through this uh, first fireside chat. And so thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me here. Can you, can you all hear me? Yes, perfect. Mike is good. Um, thank you so much for joining, those of you who are in the room. Hello to my parents on Zoom um, and anybody else who might be joining us on Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us. As Lana said, yeah, this is a conversation that hasn't really ha been had before. Um, so I'm really happy to be able to be here to be part of it. To be able to talk. Yeah, yeah. And we'd love to hear voices in the room and over Zoom as well. You know, we have a lot of tech workers that are calling in from different places. And to start us off, I wanted to, have, uh, to talk about a broad view of what it means to be underrepresented and a tech worker in the industry today. There are elections, complex geopolitical situations, humanitarian crises, civil unrest and social movements that have shaken a lot of us to our core and impact our personal lives. And how do our interactions with these platforms and our employers change as our personal and professional lives start to become intertwined in this way? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. So I did, I wrote some research called Black and Moderation, which I spoke to six uh, trust and safety workers who were identified as Black Americans who represented 12 different companies, right? And so in this research, the way that I actually described the experience, the word I used was wild, right? I actually thought an editor was going to take it out and, you know, be like, please use more precise language. And I think after reading it, that is the most descriptive way, right, of explaining the sort of yo-yo roller coaster that you end up in in these situations. I think there are so many of us, you mentioned the sort of crises, the geopolitical situations, the things that are happening in the world, so many of us end up in these jobs because we care about those things, right? And we have a skill set that we believe can be useful or helpful in helping to determine things like human rights in the middle of a crisis, right? Where we come from regions that are under crisis or in, you know, some sort of geopolitical tension. We have a deep understanding. We want to be able to help with that. 
I think what happens is very, very quickly, the personal and the professional become the same and they collapse. And I think that's when we experience a lot of this tension that we're going to be talking about. Sorry about that. Y'all can hear me. Yeah, I, I had to move from the back because I couldn't really hear. Apologies. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I can attest to that. It feels wild and you're kind of looking around and thinking, is it just me that this kind of seems right. problematic? And then other people start to talk about it and you see a lot of parallels across the industry and different companies. Um, and in one of your previous interviews, you mentioned the importance of bringing people into the, into the rooms where policies are being developed and involving people that are doing the work. Yes. Um, can you talk to us more about that? For sure. I think this was, you know, I don't want to, I'm like sensitive maybe, about maybe it. Maybe about not better. No. Let's just swap this one. Hello, out. hello. Is that better? Oh, is that better? Yeah. Apologies, y'all. I promise I know how to use the microphone. <laughs> All right. Can you repeat your question? Yeah. So, so we're talking about bringing people into these rooms when policies are being developed. The people yes. that are at the forefront yes. of this work in integrity and content moderation. Yes, yes, Tell yes. yes. I think this was the conversation we, we you said we met in Costa Rica at RightsCon last year, and it was you know, a conversation that was happening between regulators and, you know, social media companies, and they were trying to understand what happens in crisis, right? And the thing that I was saying was we don't have to start from scratch, right? Like, we don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to regulation, because there are so many people who have done this for so long, who have worked through so many different crisis situations, and have tried out various things, right? And I think it's really important for folks who have done trust and safety, who have worked in tech companies, to be a part of these conversations, right? There's so much regulation that I've read and literally like it's been laughable, right? Because I read it and I'm like, we tried that. It didn't work, right? And so being able to talk to people who have already tried out these experiences, you know what works, what doesn't work, it gives us a better place to start from. And I, it's, it's like the drumbeat that I won't let up, right? Like we have to talk to the people who have been doing the work because it's, I think it's the secret to be the, the secrets, but like the key to being able to understand and effectively regulate. Very true, yeah. I think a lot of times these conversations happen in a vacuum or don't involve all the different stakeholders that can maybe play a part um, into thinking of the best solution. Yeah. Um, and so when we talk about how we can move into this world where folks that aren't in leadership positions get a seat at the table, um, what, is the, what is your advice or how are ways that we can move to involving them more in this process? I think that's a really important question, right? So part of my research, um, one of the things that was kind of brought to light was the lack of diversity within leadership, right? And so there are so many folks who are involved in teams who might be in lower level positions or might feel powerless. And one thing that I will say is being inside of a company, there is so much power already at your disposal, right? Um, and I think being able to understand how to find moments of opportunity, even windows of opportunity to jump through when they come, um, and being able to identify uh, when those happen, when you can use your seniority, when you can use the power that's within your hands is really important. And the example that I'll give, um, you know, I was recently asked about, you know, the work that I was the most proud of, which was the first time anybody had asked me that about the work that I was uh, most proud of in a company. And I realized I had never actually talked about it, right? I've talked about so many different things and I, I said so much, but I never had actually spoken about the work I was the most proud of because it was not my actual job, right? And so the work that I looked at and I look at tech companies that I think was the most impactful, I worked on amplifying uh, the voices of women, of trans folks, of people of color, of queer folks, not just on the platform, but inside of the platforms as well by starting speaker series and having folks come in. And so the information flow became different. And that was something that lasted beyond my time there, right? But again, it wasn't my job. I just happened to be working at the company. I happened to see an opportunity, recognize that it was something that needed to be done and was able to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of us resonate with that as someone who's also underrepresented in the tech industry and as an engineer, I always felt like the only person that looked like me in this room and that I had this responsibility to speak up when things were going on or to be that representative of my community. Yeah. Um, so it is like an added burden and load on all of us. Um, but then those are the moments where you feel like you can be that voice for folks that aren't in these rooms and it becomes incredibly powerful. 
For sure. Um, and so this kind of segues into my next question um, and this concept that you brought up in your piece on being black in moderation was uh, published in the Columbia Journalism Review um, and this term of compelled identity labor, uh, which is this concept that as a minority in these positions, we feel like we have to represent your community at a company. And I finally like found the vocabulary to describe what I was doing for so long. And in 2021, me and a handful of other employees at the company were starting to notice mistakes in content moderation and escalating them to the right policy teams to try to make sure that these biases uh, were happening. And it was, uh, it was like, it felt like it was on the shoulders of just a few, you know? Yeah. Um, so tell us more about this idea and other yeah. examples that you've seen. Yeah. So, you know, I, I called it compelled identity labor and I, the idea and the sort of concept came about based on my own experiences, much like yours, right? So I was working, before I worked in trust and safety, I was worked in academia, worked in think tanks. So I was always aware of the literature that was coming out and the, you know, the research that was coming out. And I was reading it and realizing that nothing was reflecting the experiences that I was personally having. Um, and the very first thing that I saw that kind of identified with that was Sarah Roberts' book, Behind the Screen. Um, she talks a little bit uh, with a third party content moderator. And one of the things that they said was there seems to be someone inside of the trust and safety team who just has a special heart for the Middle East, right? And when I read that, I literally was like, oh my God, I know exactly what's happening here, right? And my mind immediately went to the Palestinian women that I have worked with at so many different companies who at times of intense geopolitical crisis were being called in to make decisions that were extremely personal, right? And so this was a concept that I also didn't have words for. And so when I was talking to so many of the people for this research, at the time, I literally was calling, I think, like shouldering a community, right? I was like, there's no, I need to put together some words to be able to sort of explain this experience, right? But it is something that I think, since I've written about it, has really resonated with a lot of people and is really, you know, given kind of a terminology and a phrase to, to the experience that so much of us have had, which is what I'm very grateful to have been able to do. Mm -hmm. And those of us that are underrepresented and as a person of color and a minority, there are times when we feel like we are tokenized, we're used, we really needed in these situations, we're involved in diversity and inclusion and allyship trainings. Um, but then there's times when it feels like it's performative, when there's a crisis that actually emerges, you know, what's happening in Palestine right now. And you're kind of met with silence from leadership when this is actually the time when um, those values need to be shown in the decisions and the actions that are being taken. Yeah. And so these workers that are kind of engaging in this compelled identity labor, can you tell us more about how this overburdens them? For sure. I mean, uh, it's a complete burden. I, I wrote this down. Um, one of the people that I spoke with said, uh, you don't want to always have to be that person, right? People start to look at you funny, right? Um, and another person described it. They said that I, they had to divorce themselves from themselves, right? And they had to kind of put on a different mask in order to be able to do this work, right? And it becomes you know, you mentioned the sort of sometimes you're the only person in the room. And so it feels like it is your responsibility, because if it's not you raising your voice, then there's people there's there's going to be an entire room that doesn't necessarily think about the people who identify the way that you do. Right. And so that places again, the sort of extraordinary burden on a handful of people to be able to, you know, have these really tough conversations. Um, I'm going to share an example that I have actually never talked about publicly before, um, and I, I'll tell a little bit why I've never spoken about it before. But uh, one of the things that I talked a lot about in my, my research, and I, I again wanted to talk to people about, was kind of the daily environment of working in trust and safety. And so I was working at a tech company that shall remain nameless, <laughs> um, and you know we were in a crisis situation. A user had done something, right? And so we get called into the emergency meeting. Um, in which, you know, all of us across the company, all the cross, cross functional stakeholders, you know, you know, people who are in companies will know those words, you know those words very well. So all, all of the cross functional stakeholders were in a room. That means everybody from different departments, by, by the way, uh, all in the room talking together about what we're going to do about this user who has, you know, done something, gotten themselves into trouble. When I joined the room, someone is sharing their screen uh, to kind of, you know, show what's happening. And I see that the user that we are talking about is a black person. I also see 
that the piece of content that we're looking at, this person has used the N-word. And I remember sitting there thinking very like, specifically like, I really hope that nobody reads this out loud, right? Just having that specific moment. And very quickly, not only did that happen, but the head of trust and safety goes on to read this piece of content and you know again it was a black user so they are using the n-word and it ends with an a and the head of trust and safety decides to say it and ending with a hard er right and so in that moment you know you have somebody actually explain this to me and they said you know you have this physical reaction to these words even if someone is just reading a word on a piece of paper right and so I remember reacting, and but very quickly I get called on, right? You're the most senior policy person in the room. What should we do, Anika? And so I have to take myself and say, okay, like what do I do in this situation? How do I very quickly explain, you know, the way that black people communicate, the sort of expression that happens, why we shouldn't penalize users for being black and speaking the way that they do, and do that very, very quickly while also having this super emotional reaction, right? And I said, you know, I haven't told this story before. And one of the reasons why I've never talked about this story before is because of the burden that placed on me, right? And I remember, and I would, I wish, you know, and, and Miss Whistleblower, Miss Truth Teller, always all around, you know, talking about things. And I wish that I could sit here and tell you all that, you know, I put some time on this head of trust and safety's calendar, and we sat down and we had a nuanced conversation and I explained to them about how I am a black queer woman who was raised in the South, who has been, you know, has used, had not used those words, but seen those use, those words used or had them used in very violent situations and circumstances and the impact that it would have on me, right? And why we shouldn't necessarily be saying that in the workplace. But the reality is, this was my boss, right? And I realized, do I want to go have a confrontational conversation with someone who might misconstrue this? They might think I'm calling them a racist, saying that they're racist, and that ruins our relationship. They are, again, my boss. My livelihood is in their hands. And so I decided, honestly, I'm not going to say anything, right? It was, a, <laughs> it was a Friday afternoon as well. And so I remember thinking, I have the whole weekend to get over this. But the other question that came up for me is sort of the burden, right? Like, was it my responsibility as the most senior black person at that company or in that room to then have to go talk to a senior leader and explain to them well, you, why using racial slurs in the workplace might not be appropriate, right? And why having that conversation would negatively impact me. That's the burden. Yeah. yeah. Um, and having being put in that situation and having to think that you have to pick and choose your battles because it's constantly happening and is this worth escalating or bringing up and resolving but i think a lot of people of color that are fearful and worried about this affecting their livelihood and their jobs um and being targeted more than other employees and so a lot of times those are suppressed and then they're never shared and then it's this culmination of things that never end up being talked about yeah. um and so like one example that i had observed the last few months um that maybe was an innocent mistake too and didn't happen intentionally was um, a mistake that happened on Instagram uh, with a user's bio when someone had written Palestinian and had Arabic text after it. There was a mistake with the AI translations that would um, translate the Arabic to say Palestinians are terrorists. Um, and this is clearly dehumanizing and pushing this narrative um, that is harming Palestinians right now. Um, it was quickly kind of brushed off as a hallucination and a mistake and it wouldn't happen again, but it was hard to divorce your own reaction of this being shared about your community and not really knowing how to respond when you're an employee at the company and you understand the way technology is working and how there's mistakes that come up, but also wanting to make sure this doesn't continue to happen. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing that you brought up. And I, and I will say, I think, you know, the current circumstances and the current crises that are happening are bringing so much of this work to light, right? We now have the reporting on the situation that you have talked about. The reality is, in every single crisis situation that has happened all over the world, this work has been done by a handful of humans. There is always someone who is in there advocating. And I think being able to see now and have this conversation here first, right, bringing these things to light, but also seeing journalists report on what's happening has been really, really enlightening because it's been great to see the work be noticed, right? And to recognize the activism and the burden and 
the reality that so many people are living on top of their regular job, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's not anyone's job to do that. And yet, you know, there they are. Yeah, yeah. There's groups of internal activists at these companies that are doing this in addition to their jobs as data scientists or engineers. And it's, uh, it, so for these people that are doing this additional work, what institutional support and responsibilities should be provided to them? They're clearly really needed in those situations where the context isn't really understood by a lot of folks in leadership and they're forced to kind of explain, to clarify. But what can be done to provide more of that support? Yeah, I think it's really important first that companies hire experts in things like race, ethnicity, national origin, right? These are exceedingly complex, uh, you know, ideas, right? Just to say, you know, I once worked on a policy that had to do with ethnicity and, you know, I went to the United States Census and according to the, in the United States, there are two ethnicities, Hispanic and non-Hispanic, right? That's literally all there is. If I were as a policy person who's working in a global company to take that binary and apply it to the rest of the world, we are in trouble, right? And that's why we need to have these experts from all around the world who have a better concept of ethnicity than I do, right? Being an American and really kind of growing up in this binary system. And I think hiring those experts is important because this compelled identity labor, it's not sustainable, right? It's not a good sort of business practice. I think the other thing that's really important is to, you know, support workers, right? I think, you know, I talked to the folks that I talked to, I was asking them, you know, what, what do you do? How do you take care of yourself when you're doing this work, right? And so many people were telling me that they were relying on their own sort of wellness practices, right? People were journaling or they were going to the gym, right? Or, you know, they were going for a walk, right? But there was no sort of institutionalized support for this work, right? I think being able to provide therapists or stipends for therapy, right, to be able to provide very, very real logistical support for people who are literally being damaged while doing this work is essential for companies to be able to invest in. Exactly. Um, and one thing that we were talking about just yesterday as we were debriefing, um, it was an interesting observation I had these last few months in how these, a lot of these social media platforms, there's this governance of online speech, but how this is also kind of extending into the way leadership is enforcing internal guidelines in a more extreme way. So very, very overt internal censorship that's happening when employees um, can't even talk about the problems that are affecting their communities um, because it's deemed disruptive due to some policies and employees that can't even mourn their family members that were killed and they can't post in a company Q&A asking how they can be there and stand in solidarity with their co-workers that are Palestinian during this difficult time. Um, they can't even have an organized an internal support group without screenshots being taken and leaked and these have happened across all the major tech companies. Um, and so this feels very dehumanizing um, and, and very opposite from what the platitudes that these workplaces tout with, you yeah. know, bring yourself to work. And your whole self, happy. your full self. Your whole yes. self. They can't even mention their birthplace, you know, <laughs> and where they work. So how are your thoughts on how this is damaging and how these companies can meaningfully engage in these discussions during a time of crisis? Yeah, I think one thing that I, I will say that I have, I noticed working inside of tech companies is that very often the way that a platform runs externally or it functions or it is governed externally is the way that the company is actually managed internally too, right? There is a through line between the philosophies <laughs> and the way that they are translated. And so this sort of, you know, most platforms, you have this sort of very loud, vocal, you know, group of people who tend to drive the conversation, right? Exact same thing happening inside of companies. There is a small minority of people who have a different opinion, who can, you know, band together and maybe create some sort of movement for change same thing that's happening inside of companies, right? And so I think that sort of parallel is really important to understand, especially when it comes to things like censorship, right? Or self-censorship, right? The exact same things that are happening on these companies when we see things like Palestinian folks being censored or mis mistranslations or whatever the case may be, this is also happening to employees, right? And I think it's, it's incredibly, I think, it's unfortunate, but I, again, I'm happy that it's being brought to light because this has been happening. You said you were, this, you were doing this in 2021. I was doing this in 2019, 2020, right? This is four years that we have been, 
we ourselves have been doing this work. There are people who've been doing this before us, right? So finally having it being brought to light and being able to have these conversations, I think is really important. The other thing that I will say is like, again, you have more power than you think that you do, right? And I, and I think it is, again, there's a burden of, of feeling like you have to be the person to be able to do this. And it, there is something that is so important and critical about this work. Um, and I think, you know, you've done the work and you recognize like so often the sort of reality is that it's life or death for people who happen to identify with you, right? And when those are the stakes, it's really, really hard to not get involved. Yeah, yeah. And I know folks at these companies where when it becomes this intense and extreme, you know, they'll leave out of principle, but the folks that do choose to stay, you know, for them to recognize that they're in a position of privilege and there's a lot of advocacy they can do internal and we need people pushing for this change from all different sides. For, for sure. And I'm going to, I'm going to add on this because I think this is such an important piece, right? We will always need people working inside of tech companies, right? Mm -hmm. Change will never happen. I mean, it might happen, but my theory of change and the way that I have seen things work takes a variety of people and a variety of different angles advocating for change. And so you can have the external advocacy, but you need somebody internally who's going to be able to write the policy, who's going to be able to have the conversation, who's going to be able to make the argument when it counts. And so I, to that person, to all of those people who are continuing to do that work, that is the Lord's work, right? It is, it is, a, it is the work that like more power to you, mm -hmm. right? Because it is so incredibly important and i just want to say like we see you right we honor that work and part of why we are here is to talk about it and to honor it mm -hmm. and it feels like you know we've been doing this work for years 2019 2021 to 2023 and right now um, it still feels like a lot of times as we're pushing for these changes internally there's still a lot of reactive measures that are taken and responses from leadership that are either made just to placate employees or just band-aid solutions that aren't really addressing the foundational issues and you know senior leadership that also say things like usually when employees escalate things it's just an hr problem so how can we really push for these changes to happen so that we're not constantly bringing up the same things year over year yeah i think that's a i think that's a really interesting sort of you know approach and i think when you're sitting inside of a company it's really easy to also feel like you're being ignored Right, or that what you're saying doesn't necessarily matter. And I, again, I, I want to encourage folks who are doing that work that it is incredibly important because so many moments that I have seen, right, there have been people internally who have been pushing for a change or pushing for a policy or pushing for something and it's never been prioritized. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, there's a crisis or the New York Times has you on the front page talking about the thing that you have been trying to work on and all of a sudden, it's a priority. There's resources, right? And as if you are the person who has been kind of beating that drum, you are able to then at that moment pick it up and run with it, right? But it is, it's incredibly unfortunate that sometimes it really does take that sort of external pressure for, for it to happen. Yeah. But also it requires that internal person as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's got it got to a point where you had decided to leave and you became a whistleblower, which I think is kind of what put you in the spotlight. Um, so I wanted to ask and understand and share with the audience why you decided to become a whistleblower, what advice you have for tech work workers that want to share their experiences externally. You know, there's still, still taboo and there's yeah. a stigma around leaking information. Um, and so, yeah, how, uh, how has that been? <laughs> how has it been? <laughs> <laughs> well, we I'm like looking at the clock. We don't have enough time to talk about how that has been. Yes, I, I did uh, decide to come forward publicly as a whistleblower. And, you know, I'm not the first whistleblower from, from Trust and Safety. And, you know, in the in the research that I did, I talked specifically about EFOMA at Pinterest and Charlotte at Amazon and Joelle um, at TikTok, right? And how these folks coming forward has given, you know, sort of the first inside insight that we have into how many, so many people are treated, right? And I also think, right, working in trust and safety, you see the worst things day in and day out. And can you imagine how bad things must happen? The bad of the worst has to be for you to be willing to like risk your career, right? Risk everything to be able to come forward and say, this thing has happened. And in my case, you know, it was democracy, right? And that was something that was, continues to be much bigger than me, 
right? And so it was important. I felt that it was important for me after, you know, I think the thing about whistleblowing is like, it kind of has a bad rep, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, and I, I get it. Um, you know, when, when I first became whistleblower and people called me a whistleblower, I was like, please don't. Like, just, <laughs> I've, I've gotten a little better with it now these days, right? But I think there's, there's a lot of negative connotations with it. But I think the thing is, is like, you don't have to do what I did, right? You don't have to come forward, go talk to Congress, testify to Congress under oath mm -hmm. on C-SPAN, right? Like, that's a, that's a very specific path. I think that there are so many other ways to be able to tell the truth. And I would encourage people to do this. First, actually, let me say this. I encourage nobody to tell the truth or talk to anybody without first talking to a lawyer and or a whistleblower organization so you understand your rights and your risks. I am a lawyer and I really mean that. Like, as a person who is actually a lawyer, I also had to go talk to lawyers first, right? So please, 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 please make sure that you are protected. But again, there are other ways to do it, right? You can, I, I think of the folks who, you know, talk to me in doing the research, right? That is a form of truth telling, right? They're completely anonymous. They're pseudonymous, you know, and their names will never be known. Their identities will never be known, but their stories have now created an impact, right? I think there's a reality of that. There's, you know, writing, right? There's what we're doing right here that is important too. Exactly, yeah. And I think a lot of these avenues people just don't know about, right? Mm -hmm. Whistleblowing is the one that's mostly public. Uh, a lot of people have is a lot more attention on it, um, and a lot of people worry about even going to the media about things because sensationalist headlines and how this kind of can sometimes frame not really the most accurate picture. Um, so for folks that maybe don't really want to talk to media, um, like you're saying, join us on the other side. There's a lot of work that can be done in public interest tech and work that you can do that's not within a tech company. For sure, right? I think there. this is a really, really interesting moment. There are so many practitioner fellowships now, right? That was not like a, a thing four years ago, right? There are so many new spaces to be able to contribute your ideas, your writing, your voice, right? To, you know, helping regulation, to furthering conversations. And so I would encourage folks who are, you know, trying to figure out what to do with their unique skill set that they have developed and this you know work that they have done come join us right come come join these conversations write what you know i think you and i were talking about you know there have been so many people recently who have left industry and have been publishing and i've just been so excited to see these voices you know coming into the space with this incredibly nuanced you know you know uh recommendations right and i think that that is so important um and again we still need folks inside of tech companies too right it's yeah. it's such a it's a entire i think ecosystem of change exactly yeah yeah and so with that that concludes our preset questions if there are any questions from the audience either in person or zoom you can start passing the microphone around i i i can start off with a question yeah um i guess it's Starts off on a bit of a sour note, but I hopefully ends positively. It's like a sour patch kid, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, but I guess uh, just taking in 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 light of the the layoffs that have unfortunately affected yes. the tech industry, especially in trust and safety. Yeah. I guess if you could speak to whether uh, whether you're still connected to folks who are mm -hmm. still at platforms or elsewhere, um, have the burdens of compelled identity labor gotten worse in light of some of those layoffs, which have really affected some of the centers of the advocacy? And, and knowledge and expertise within platforms that you've described? For sure, right? So I, when I was doing my research, um, it was during kind of the first wave of layoffs in 2022. Yes, yes. Um, and it impacted my ability to do the research, right? I think, you know, there were folks who I talked to who came back to me and said, like, the industry has completely changed, right? Like, we, we no longer have job stability and I can't be involved in this research, right? Um, and that was, you know, the first round. There have been so many more rounds of layoffs now that I think, you know, the job security is even more fragile than what it ever was. You know, I told my story about why I didn't necessarily speak up in a moment because of job security, right? I'm certain that those situations have only become more strenuous, right? When you realize, like, there's a round of layoffs happening every couple of months and all that is necessary is for you know, my boss to have one thing that we might ne not necessarily agree on for me to be the person that's on the chopping block, right? 
it makes you be a little bit less hesitant or less willing to take on the risk, right? And I think that that is so unfortunate because, you know, the conversation that we're having is how important these things are, right? Because it's literally very often the digital human rights around the entire world of people who happen to identify with you, right? That is a, it's a, it's unfathomable, right? Like how big of a, of a task and how big of a deal that it is. And I think, I think the market uncertainty has only made it worse. Appreciate that. And one question from online as well. Um, I, this is someone who I guess is uh, uh, not my parents. Not your parents. <laughs> no. But um, <laughs> interested in exploring the sort of practitioner fellowships mm -hmm. that you've mentioned. So I guess if you could give uh, as much of a survey or just elaborate on those opportunities a little bit. Absolutely. So the the research that I did uh, that I keep talking about, Black and Moderation, it's a Columbia uh, Journalism Review. Um, I actually did that during a practitioner fellowship at Stanford. Um, and that, that fellowship, I think it's been around, um, don't quote me on this, I'm like being recorded too. Um, I don't know how many years, but it has been around, so I will not give an exact number on it. Um, but it is, it is one that I remember when it first uh, was announced, I remember seeing it and thinking like, oh, I really want to do that. But I was having, I was working at a company at the time and I was like, I was a little overburdened as we've been talking about. And I was like, I don't think I necessarily have the capacity to be able to take this on, right? Um, but that, that program exists. I think it's a very, very wonderful one. It's uh, with the Digital uh, Civil Society Lab. Um, we're here at Berkman, right? There are y'all, I think the fellowship application closed. So maybe not this round, y'all, but I think this is a very, very great place to be able to have these conversations as well. Um, I know that you all have your newsletter that you send out that has so many different job opportunities on it and so many different fellowship opportunities. I think being involved or getting yourself, you know, on the listservs that are spitting those things out. There are also, you know, trade organizations that are popping up now that, that haven't been around for a while, but like are incredibly helpful. I think they're also, you know, sending out information about fellowships, you know, jobs, resources that could be available. Amazing, thank you. And another question from online um, is from a, an undergraduate student who's taking a course on key societal values that are affected by emerging technologies. Bless you. And they're, they're curious about, I guess, two, one of the values uh, covered in the course is solidarity and inclusion. Yes. Um, and they're wondering how best we understand that concept, especially in the context of emerging technologies, um, and uh, better ways to conceptualize it than how it's commonly understood. Solidarity and inclusion. Wow, that's a really great question. Um, I think Nadia, you and I uh, talked about this a little in one of our conversations. Um, you know, I think there's like the, these, these are like big concepts, right? You can like, it's like compelled identity labor. They're like words. So you can put like definitions to it. Like, what does it actually like really mean? Um, I can give a very, very concrete example. I remember I, there was a, there was a time and a company that again, shall remain nameless, that I was also doing my compelled identity labor during a specific moment. And I remember being completely, I feeling completely overwhelmed, right? Like I had, I had a, an intense argument. I mean, you know, by the time the arguments finally, you know, finish and we come around to we're going to do something, you're tired, right? And then you have to open up a blank Google Doc and start writing, right? And I remember I had a colleague uh, at the time who saw what was going on, um, a non-black colleague, and said, "I'll write it for you," right? And I remember in that moment thinking, like, "Oh, this is what it means." like this is exactly what these ideas mean in action of i see i literally see what you have been going through in order to make this happen i'm going to take this labor off of your plate so that you are not going to have to be the person that has to carry this on and you know they ended up writing the thing i came back you know we reviewed it we had this great sort of conversation and back and forth but it's in those moments of understanding like what does what does solidarity really look like Right. It's not being silent in moments. It's not, you know, sometimes it's sending the Slack message that says, I see you. And sometimes it's literally picking up the work and pick, taking the burden from somebody else and, and deciding, like, this one doesn't really hurt me as much. So, like, I can do it. Thanks. And we have more questions coming in online, but we can yeah, pause at any moment to, to. Oh, perfect. Hey, thanks for joining us. I have a. I have a long question for you. Let's do it. So, I'll build off the first question here. There's 
uncertainty with jobs right now, right? Yes. So we're seeing a lot of consolidation happen across the industry. So a lot of these teams are becoming smaller, people are having to take on more work. Mm -hmm. Ultimately what happens is engineering teams are now being tasked with improving models. And so models are becoming um, very sophisticated mm -hmm. and they're being trained based on past data, mm -hmm. which many times has a significant amount of bias yes. associated yeah. with it, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens now is things that are being flagged in the past that have been overlooked are now being used to train our new models. Mm -hmm. And so with increased automation, a lot of the stuff is going to be gone just unnoticed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have a large voice or a large platform for distribution, it's ignored, okay? And so I see a lot of these large companies are in a no-win situation. Mm -hmm. You're constantly playing defense. Something's always going to come up. You have fewer people working on these problems and you have models that you don't really understand how they're working mm -hmm. because it's just building on top of each other every day. Mm -hmm. And the people who built it are no longer at the company. Right? <laughs> they left a long time ago, right? yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, a real issue is documentation. Mm -hmm. yes. So the people who built it yes. didn't write it down and now they're no longer there. Yes. So I guess my question for you mm -hmm. is, how are you seeing really the next two years because the growth in AI right now is is just exponential. Yeah, yeah. The next, it's, I think it's interesting that you say the next two years because I'm like, can I see beyond 2024 right now, right? Like I think this, this, this monster um, of an election year is, you know, I think going to be the greatest challenge for trust and safety teams and technology companies that, that we have ever seen, right? Um, and I, I think, this question of like increasing AI, you and I were talking about like, y'all probably know this, but like every funder loves AI these days, right? And it's like, AI, we love it, right? Everyone want, do something with AI. And it's like, what is the something that you want me to do with AI? <laughs> I just want me to like write the words in the document. And like, that's where we're at, right? I think, you know, you, you were talking about uh, uh, an AI and I was like, oh, the bias within it, right? And I think that's such an important issue. And I think one of the, the examples that I will give that I, you know, used to work on was specifically around um, hate speech detection models, right? And how, you know, Facebook did, um, Facebook did some research on their own, on their own algorithm and found out that it was taking down content that was integrating towards white people more than anything else, right? So heavily biased, like we're going to take down hate speech, but we're also going to protect this one group that might not necessarily be the most vulnerable, right? And I think the reality is, is that, you know, you're saying like somebody built that system five, 10 years ago has moved on, right? I think there's a real need to sort of go back and reevaluate the very basics, right? Um, this was something that I, I really wanted to be able to do and was never sort of able to do, right? Which was like, how do I get into this and understand like, what is, what is the training data? Like, is it biased? What are we doing here, right? I don't, I don't think I necessarily know, right? Like how we solve for that. But I think it's important, again, to go back to the foundation, to go back to the basics and understand, like um, a good friend of mine uh, and a lawyer and researcher, Rashida Richardson, wrote uh, a law review article called Dirty Data. Um, and it's based on, you know, data is based on segregation, right? And so we have this data that is consistently dirty. How do we clean it up? Maybe you'll figure it out and then you can tell me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, I think just to say, like, one of, one of the things I think when we talk about content moderation, we talk about trust and safety, I often think that we are tasked with the impossible, right? It is literally like boiling the ocean. And I think the thing that you can do is your very best with the information that you have on the day that you're doing it. One, one question from online and I'll, I'll bring it over to you. Um, uh, a question from someone who is working at a search engine company who believes that them and their coworkers have been falsely empowered. They're wondering how or how can you sense when your time is running out at a company and what are the signs of job security fading when you've exercised protected speech and have faith in reasonable people and your role? Well, I will say, if you are asking if your time is coming, your time is coming. <laughs> <laughs> that is the first step. When you start thinking, 
Huh. I think that's it. Um, you know, I was, I, I have always been a proponent for an exit strategy, especially when you start speaking up, right? I think you have to recognize I am taking on risk here and therefore I need to figure out what option B, C, D, E, and F are going to be because this is incredibly risky, right? Um, I think, you know, sort of the question on like, when do you leave? I think this is a kind of a hard one, right? Because the reality is, is that these are jobs. They're there to help you pay the bills. And if you leave a job on a moral conviction, your bills are not going to stop, right? Like I blew the whistle, the bills didn't stop just because I blew the whistle, right? They, they kept coming. And I think having to understand that and maybe at times, honestly, make those sort of conflicting moral decisions of, you know, Am I going to stay at this company that is doing something that I might not necessarily agree with because I happen to live in capitalism? Like, maybe, right? And that's a really, 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 really unfortunate thing to do. And I, I understand that it becomes, you know, very, very heavy. And it, you can kind of get that cognitive dissonance, right? Of like, I'm here to do good, but I'm not necessarily doing that. Um, and again, like, get work on your exit strategy always have an exit strategy i think the sort of you know the market uncertainty makes it even harder because you know when i was working in companies it was very very easy it was like the heyday it was like oh you worked at twitter you can work anywhere right like that's you just kind of hopped around and you would see people from the same companies that you used to work at going to the next company right i think those days are kind of over and i mean speaking of ai right like AI is now creating their entire regulatory system that is based on the way that social media is regulated, right? They have entire trust and safety teams. Jump over there, see what's happening over there. Thank you very much for your insights. And my question is more about crisis situations mm. and trust and safety, as we talked about the war in Ukraine or now the war in Gaza and where we see, despite all the layoffs, there are lots of adverts looking for people speaking these particular yes. languages to get involved. Yes. And obviously that puts a huge strain on the organizations dealing with all of the, you know, awful and yeah. Yeah, things that are coming in. And I was wondering if you think that in the long term, these kind of crisis situations that also open up to different ways of seeing the world that are maybe beyond the very US centric ways of dealing with issues, if that can be a longer term learning for these companies or if you've seen that in the past, or if you think it's really just crisis moments and once they are kind of no longer the center of attention, it all goes back to normal and there's not really a way forward. I think it has to be a learning lesson, right? If we are going to get this right, if they're, you know, right in quotes again, doing an impossible job, um, I think it has to be a learning opportunity. I think, you know, one of the, one of the biggest biases that are baked into technology companies is the, you know, the San Francisco bias, right? That's where a lot of people are headquartered in so many different ways and in so many different things. Like you cannot get an answer or a decision unless it goes through the top bosses in San Francisco, right? And I think that provides and creates an extreme, an extreme bias, right? Um, the other thing that I, I want to pick up on what you said is language specialties and, and being a native speaker. You know, I think you know, there's been a lot of reporting that's come out recently. The Guardian did this like expose where they were like, oh my gosh, TikTok doesn't have native speakers and people who don't speak English are using Google Translate. And I was like, yeah, right. Like this has been going on for a very long time. Uh, Mudge, the Twitter whistle, the other Twitter whistleblower, when he came forward, he said, you know, the misinformation team at Twitter is using Google Translate in order to figure out what is happening here, right? Like that's a problem. And I think it requires to say, I think that I've given you this example before, but you know, I was working at a company and I all I speak English, it's the only language I speak. Um, and I always refused to make a decision on content that was in a language that I didn't speak. It was like a, a serious thing that I had. That is not a conviction that everybody has, right? And I think it's really important, again, for people who are in these positions to make those sort of stances. The example I will give, um, you know, uh, there was a, a piece of content that came in once. It was in Arabic um, and I sent it to three different people. I sent it to a colleague who was a white man who happened to attend an Ivy League school and major in Arabic studies and spoke Arabic. I sent it to uh, a woman who was born in Egypt who also majored in Arabic studies in Egypt. And then I sent it to a Palestinian woman, Palestinian woman who was born in Gaza. Right? So I sent it to all these different folks. Um, 
And, you know, the translations that came back were incredibly different, <laughs> right? Uh, the first person, you know, who was majored in Arabic studies in the United States came back and said to me, well, you know, it's, it's kind of bad, but we can leave it up. The other folks who were, who were natural speakers, this is their, their language that they, they have grown up in, they understand different dialects, right? They're able to see what's going on, came back and said to me, we have to take this down immediately, right? Like, this is awful. Like, this is the kind of stuff that gets people harmed. And the difference in that sort of dichotomy was fascinating to me because it was a reality of if I wasn't the person who was in the position to be able to say, I am going to wait. First of all, I'm not making a decision on this. That also is, it's problematic because we're waiting, right? We're going to wait. This thing is going to stay up until we figure this out and make it right. But again, like that very specific scenario made me remember and always realize the importance of understanding, like being American centric, especially in content moderation, it harms people, right? It's literally dangerous. Jim build off of that too. In these times of crisis, like uh, Annika was saying, use it as like a learning lesson and figure out where is the best place to put that pressure and build off of that momentum. In 2021, I remember when you're taking this reactive approach of just trying to bring this Facebook group back up or getting this account restored, you're constantly fighting these fires. But then, you know, 2023 comes and then we're seeing the same thing over and over again because we are so focused on just like mitigating what's happening. And instead, making sure you reflect holistically, realize that maybe there's just not the right people in the places that you know should be there to make sure that we're changing the policies when they need to, or that people are properly trained um, in the languages and dialects um, when it's needed, so that when another crisis comes, we're not constantly fighting the same battles. For sure. Two questions from online on a topic that you touched on earlier, Nada. Um, the first is companies have their own internal guidelines that are used to censor employees by deciding what subjects are forbidden. Those guidelines are not public and yes. NDAs prevent employees from yes. talking about them externally. Yes. Um, how can we keep companies accountable? And a related question is, uh, what are the top pieces of advice either you can offer to meta employees trying to organize against that form of internal and external censorship and calling for leaders to be more transparent to the public and our policy and our model implementations? Uh, we're trying to create a union similar to the Alphabet Workers Union. Yeah, um, I, I'll answer them and then I'll, I'll, I'll sort of um, kick it over to you. Um, I, I empathize with these folks, uh, whoever is writing these questions tremendously, um, to say like these sort of internal codes have grown and gotten worse, right? Like I, when I worked at companies, they weren't this bad, right? Um, one thing that I, I will say, right, like this person said, they're not public, right? Not encouraging anybody to leak any sort of information or to do anything of those sorts, because I would never do anything like that. And I think bringing things to public, right? Like the things that you are so familiar with that you see, somebody has like literally never even fathomed that that would, would even exist. Right. And so I think showing the public like this is what is actually being said. These are the guidelines that are we're actually being, you know, imposed on us, I think would be shocking to so many people. Um, the other uh oh, sorry, go ahead. yeah, I was I was gonna say, I know everyone's appetite for risk is different. Some people are willing to leak information. Others, when you're in that situation and you're seeing these things at the company, I still don't know the nuance of what is more risky than uh what would be the most risky but talking about your own personal experiences and what you're facing i feel like writing your own things maybe not leaking you know a th you know information that could be a little controversial but just sharing what you've observed and how this has affected you at the very least gets the conversation going for sure i want to thank you for coming this has been really i've learned a lot and i appreciate you being yeah. here um, I have a question about advocacy kind of in a broader sense, mm -hmm. you know, I, in the work that I do, I have opportunities to talk to parents and talk to, you know, teens and otherwise about issues that don't specifically pertain to what you're getting at, but they do pertain to the idea that maybe as citizens, we have some role in trying to educate our relatively moronic senators or representatives about <laughs> what could be done. I mean, the, 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 the appalling state of legislation around this is distressing. Yeah. But I have to be honest, I, I'm not actually sure of uh, what should I say, you know, we should as citizens being advocating for blank, mm -hmm. like what, what is the blank that we should say, 
to our representatives or to our officials or to our to each other. This is what I would like to see the government do to help uh, protect people. So I would love to hear your insights. That's a, that's a great question. And, you know, I have spent a lot of time talking to Congress, uh, <laughs> giving them my ideas on, on this sort of thing to say, I think the first step is just regulation, right? Like anything. We are at a place where we literally have we have section 230 that says you can do what you want basically i mean that's not what it says I, i'm a lawyer i've read it like please don't I, I, people are people are very precious about 230 as you all know right and but i think the the sort of reality is is that we need something i i'm a big advocate of a of a regulatory scheme that mirrors something like the national uh transportation and safety board right so sort of like baseline standard for safety that says like you can't go flying if you don't have all the bolts right something very very simple and also the other reality of okay so there was a crash there was something that went horrifically wrong right like how do we come in get the black box figure out what happened and make sure that it doesn't happen again right we have nothing like that we have no oversight like that that's happening for technology companies and i think starting with something that simple something independent you know, regulatory body that is able to do something like that, I think is a giant first step. Here, yeah. uh, Sorry I, to point. <laughs> thank, thank you for your comments. Um, so I'm a lawyer too, but from Canada, so we love regulation. Ooh, um, so <laughs> I love that for y'all. Can you like send that down, please? Yeah, 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 Just yeah, yeah. in the water, please. <laughs> I always have to preface my remarks from that when I like, you know, argue for regulation or like you're Canadians. Anyway. Um, but I just wondered if you also, uh, I, I like what you're saying about, um, obviously, about, you know, oversight bodies and, and managing safety that way, but what about employment law levers? Um, so, you know, you're talking about the question was about non-disclosure agreements, there's been work on non-compete clauses and how they've had, like, way too much um, overreach For sure. and had a problematic effect, um, more of a kind of economic argument, but you know, uh, all these ways in which workers are silenced or, or punished for speaking up about things that are in the public interest mm -hmm. seem to me like things that could be dealt with through employment law levers. For um, sure. I'm just kind of curious as your thoughts on, about that. For sure. So I mentioned Ifoma, the whistleblower from Pinterest earlier, and Ifoma worked on, I think it was called the, the Silent No More um, Act. Again, I'm saying a lot of things on that are being recorded, but <laughs> Back check me on that. Um, and um, that that was specifically uh, geared towards employment law and thinking about NDAs and saying in these specific circumstances, if you know discrimination happens uh, based on these protected categories, your NDA is no longer good, right? But I I think that question of employment law NDAs is a really, really important one. I mean, we literally had a question that said, you know, I when I decided to show up at this company, like I basically signed my life rights away and said I would never talk about this again, right? Like, to me, that's incredibly unfair, right? It's incredibly unfair for you to have to go work at a company, give it your heart, your soul, your mind, your brain, right? And then never be able to speak about it again, especially when at times you do work that literally changes the world, right? I think it's important for folks to be able to speak out. I am all about trying to figure out various levers for this to happen. I think employment law is a very, very good one. I think there's some great whistleblower attorneys who are also thinking about things like this. Um, and I would love to see, I would love to see that happen, right? As, as I've sent a lot of NDAs in my life, right? And you know, they are, they are restrictive and they're hard and um, I think they're unfair. Are you worried at all that bad regulation might be worse than no regulation? I mean, we've got people trying to take books out of libraries and schools, and I don't really want to think about what Josh Hawley and Marjorie Taylor Greene might uh, try to enact as legislation to regulate the internet. You know what? This is going to sound crazy, but one of the best pieces of regulation that I have seen for the internet actually comes from Josh Howley. Really? Like, I know that sounds okay, insane, <laughs> right? I know, I know you probably would never expect those words to come out of my mouth. Like, I highly disagree with a lot of things that are in there, but I think it's a solid structure, right? And I, I think this is something that I, 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 you can hear me being like passionate about it, right? The reason why I'm saying we need like an independent, independent regulatory body is because I think there's actually so much consensus in the fact that social media companies have way too much power and they are not responsible with it, right? I think that is a bipartisan agreement that we can all just sort of get behind, right? 
where where it's become culture wars is the like how do we do that and on what specific topics yeah. right and i think that is the incredibly challenging part and comes to the point that you're saying is like well what if we over regulate versus you know not regulate at all and i think that's a great question but i think the fear of over regulation can't stop us from doing nothing right so i think a lot about the dsa right and so uh one of the oh, one of the uh, hmm? you think a lot about the user. Oh, the, the, the uh, Digital Service Act in uh, the UK, which is a piece of regulation. Um, another piece of regulation that came in uh, was the Media Exemption Act that was part of the DSA, right? And it was a, you know, I, I wrote an op-ed about it and saying like, this is horrible, right? It, it was a sort of, um, anybody could self-declare as media, a media institution, right? Which is like, they can't like, this is disinformation highway, right? And the reality of that was, you know, as much as this one piece of this regulation might make this entire thing not work, which was, you know, is a horrible thing, we still need the regulation, right? And I, I would continue to argue that, you know, it's, it's easier to pull back and say like, oh, we're doing too much, right? Than it is to say like, we're not doing anything. I think a question that follows up on that uh, very nicely. Um, come tomorrow, our online audience, how can we as average trust and safety workers who've been on the ground share our views on how to make policies actually effective with policymakers when they are only hearing either from tech executives or lobbyists or a few big names from the industry? Are there ways that we can provide input without taking a government job or a think tank job? Absolutely, right? Um, there are so many congressional people who are willing to have off the record conversations with tech workers about these very specific things, right? Um, you know, part of my kind of astonishment in talking to Congress was recognizing how little people actually knew about how social media worked, right? There were so many assumptions of like, well, then it, this happens. And I was like, mm, yeah, no, like that does not happen. In an ideal world, like I know somebody wrote in a book that that's what's supposed to happen, right? But like, that's not actually what happens. And so I think, you know, one thing I, I would recommend if, if, if you're into it is writing these things down, right? Like I've been writing a lot of op-eds, so op-eds are like, you know, a way, a way to go if that's what you're, you're interested in. Um, but I think sharing your ideas and, sh and sharing the knowledge and the skill set that you have is incredibly important. And I think, again, you don't have to necessarily go work in civil society. You don't have to work at a think tank. You can stay working inside of a tech company and establish relationships. I think one thing to do is, go Google, like, who's working on this, right? I'll say Senator Warren's office has been doing fantastic work on this area, right? Like, those emailed addresses are all public. Just gonna put that out there. Mm -hmm. right before this event, we were also talking about outlets like Tech Policy Press that yes. invite contributors from all different spaces. When I first started this fellowship, I wrote an op-ed and published it with them and was joking saying this is the first time I've written something more than code. But the thing is they do want practitioners and technologists to give their perspective because we see how things work with social media companies. And a lot of times we just didn't know that anyone else wanted to listen. Yes, big shout out to Justin and Tech Policy Press. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm not a technologist. I actually work. God bless you. <laughs> yes, uh, maybe. I work in civil society at an organization called ECHO, where we do corporate accountability work, mm -hmm. and I focus on tech accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I just want to say the power angle that you all were talking about from an outsider is so very real mm -hmm. in the sense that the type of power that companies have oftentimes bigger than countries themselves in terms of the, the breadth of wealth and, and, For sure. and force um, gets reflected back when employees and whistleblowers come out and speak to the public for what civil society and individuals who are sort of looking at this world very much use as sort of facts on the ground. Um, whistleblowing related to India, tech harms on kids, uh, <clears throat> the no tech for apartheid, uh, with Google is, is a great example of that. So just echoing for everybody listening in, in this world to know that that power is actually front and center for civil society who's trying to take an effective look at uh, accountability. And then not, not necessarily a question, but maybe just an angle from the world that I sit in looking into the tech world for this upcoming year. Um, everybody's calling it the year of democracy. There are 70 plus elections that are happening around the world. 
trust and safety teams have been slashed and for years civil society has been calling for the bolstering of trust and safety teams across languages all around the world and this is one thing that I think <clears throat> I often have a little bit of a conversation in my head all the time thinking like <clears throat> do these companies know that this is happening like that there's all these elections that are going to be taking place and the sort of institutional power to slash those on the front lines for protecting democracies across the world is sort of going downhill. Um, and I know that there's a Silicon Valley bias and I think it often gets reflected to minimal to near none uh, credible work in the global south where these elections sure. actually have very real world harms. We can look at India, for example. For sure. Um, but just maybe a question to you all who have been in the sort of Silicon Valley bubble on where and how these broader big conversations that I think most people in the public and those especially in civil society are, are sort of zoomed in on um, are able to see from their C-suite offices or, or yeah. nearby. I think that's a great question. So you're saying, you're saying, and I agree with you, like this is a monster election year, right? But that also requires you to under have a understanding or a care about the rest of the world, right? And a knowledge that maybe something else is going on in the rest of the world. And very often, as I mentioned, there's a San Francisco bias, right? And if you are in your San Francisco bubble, you might not even know the names of the countries that are having an election, right? So you're not gonna necessarily even staff up to like go participate in that election, protect that election, especially not in the language in which folks are speaking because you don't necessarily know, right? And I think that that is, that is a huge bias. The other thing that I will say to your sort of um, your advocacy piece, right? So before I started working in companies, I actually worked at Color of Change and I built their platform accountability process. And so the process and their framework and their playbook. And so I, I again, I think my theory of change requires everybody being in the room, right? You know, so many times I worked, I worked on the opposite side of the Stop Hate for Profit campaign, of the Stop Asian Hate campaign, Twitch Do Better campaign, right? All of these campaigns that have hit. I was the person inside of the company saying, okay, so you're getting this pressure. This is great. These recommendations might not necessarily work the way that these folks want them to. So then how do I, you know, do something to help in this situation? And I think it requires that external pressure plus the internal work, plus the regulators, right? Plus this conversations that we're having. All of this is required in order for us to get to a place of change. We're already 10 minutes over, but a few more questions from online if, if you two are good. I have time. All right, perfect. <laughs> um, one is, uh, I guess, stepping outside of a, an American perspective, um, but asking if you have any thoughts about the outsourcing of content moderation by tech companies to the global south. Um, the general implications and a specific question, do you think this trend exacerbates socioeconomic disparities and perpetuates digital colonialism? Yes. Um, but to the, the last question, yes. Um, you know, third party content moderation jobs uh, are the folks who are on the front lines of content moderation and sit in queues all day long and have a timer that says you only have about 10 seconds in order to make a yes or no decision, bio, bio no bio, right? That's what you're doing all day long, looking at the worst content on the internet. It is a job that has been proven to be exceedingly damaging, right? People get messed up by doing these jobs. Their brains no longer work the same. People lose memory, right? Like it is incredibly challenging. And to take these jobs and to say we are going to export them to the global majority and have these folks doing the work. It's been already happening. It has been happening for a long time. And my question is why, right? Why is this a business model? Why has this become a sustainable business model? And I think it is very much for the reasons of, you know, digital colonialism has been happening and colonization has been happening forever, right? These companies are taking, they're literally taking the American idea of things like free expression and exporting them to the rest of the world, right? This has been happening for so long. And I think that the, the sort of systems of content moderation that are set up and the ways that we rely on the labor of people of color or marginalized communities to be able to do the worst of the worst work only replicates the worst parts of our society. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, of course. <clears throat> Thank you. thank you so much. This was wonderful. And also echoing what Jeff said, thank you for all the work you've done in this space. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Um, kind of zooming in a bit back to the tech workers inside the companies. Um, 
I was, so I taught at MIT last year and it was mostly a group of undergrads gunning for tech jobs. For the money's at, yeah. Yeah, and I assume most of them will probably end up there or a lot, a good chunk of them. And so I've been thinking how, do you see a way forward in terms of academia or education preparing tech workers oh, for, for this sure. kind of solidarity work or going more in with their eyes open to what it's like and what they need to do? I think that's a really great question. Yeah. And I, you know, I've talked to a couple of folks who, who have been thinking about this and I, I would love to see classes that teach people how to do this work, right? Mm -hmm. I think one of the hardest things about doing trust and safety work is that you know, for a long time, there was no sort of training in the field and so much of it was learning on the job. The example that I always give is the time that I was told to make sure that World War III didn't start on the platform. And I was told I had 48 hours to make it happen. And it was real life, right? And I am not a foreign diplomat, right? And I remember sitting there thinking, can I please call the UN? Like, can I call somebody who knows what they're doing? And the it was me, it was me and my, my team who was sitting here doing this work. And the reality is, is like, those stakes are entirely too high to be dealing with untested and like folks who might not necessarily know what they're doing, right? And I think that we need to train workers to be able to do this work in a like, in an environment where the stakes are not that high, right? Like it's, you know, it's a classroom. No one's, no one's actually gonna die here, right? Like. Let's talk through why this might not necessarily work out, right? Like, let's talk about what's actually happening here. And I think that that is such an important thing. And I, and I will say, like, you know, the trust and safety jobs inside of social media companies, we've all been talking about how there's so many layoffs happening. And, like, that might not be, you know, the regulatory model that continues to persist throughout that, like, that specific industry. But, again, all of these AI companies are creating trust and safety teams. And those are places that I think so many students, I would encourage them to go work in, right? You know, um, one of the things that I always say to people is, if you see something, save a copy, right? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah. that's, that's my advice. That's excellent. Thanks. <laughs> I'm just curious, are you aware of any initiatives in any educational institutions that you think are starting to do a good job on this? Or, I mean, I'm hoping that I can hopefully do something in this area. So like, yes, me. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do this, but like, I, I, if anybody else is also interested in this, like, let's please talk. No, no, I think that they're really great. You know, it was, uh, I went and was able to talk to um, Desmond Patton's class at the University of Pennsylvania, who teaches a wonderful uh, digital advocacy course, right? Um, Ruha Benjamin at Princeton, I went and talked to her class as well, who also teaches a wonderful tech accountability uh, class as well. These classes are happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think right. there's also a piece of embedding those ideas into the courses people are already taking, yes. because you'll notice the yeah. students that are taking those classes that are at the intersection of tech and ethics actually care, but it's something everyone should know that if you're taking an engineering job at a tech company, like you may be faced with some moral and ethical dilemmas, and you're going to have to think about this eventually. So I think there's this whole restructuring of these courses where having it embedded in what you're required to take, but also having opportunities to learn. And I was so pleasantly surprised to find out five years after I graduated that my university now has a race, gender, and computing course where we talk about these issues. Um, but we didn't have that back in my day. We had one class that was listed to the School of Global Policy on cybersecurity that actually talked about kind of like that human piece of how is technology affecting people. But before that, we didn't really have a lot. Yeah, we've come a long way. Literally, you know, when I when I first started working in this, like trust and safety was not an industry, right? Mm -hmm. There were no, I remember when I graduated, I was like, I really want to do this. There were no jobs, right? I literally had to wait for the jobs to come around. And now we're at a place the jobs exist. You have classes, you can create your create your own opportunities, you know. You have yeah. like this knowledge and skill set. Position yourself in a way where you're contributing in a way that you can. Well, perhaps a good personal note to end on a, a final question about now that you've taken the whistleblower step, how do you not burn out and what are your support systems for continuing <laughs> the advocacy work? <laughs> ah, that was not a funny question, but I surely got a kick out of it clearly. Um, you know, I think that's a really great question. I I will say this, I, I've, incur I've said a lot of things encouraging people to like, you know, share information. I have always said we need more whistleblowers, and I have also always said I cannot in good conscience ask anybody to do what I have done, right? I cannot ask people to walk down the road that I have walked down. It is lonely. It is isolating. It is impossible. It is really, 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 really hard, right? And I think, you know, there is not a lot of support in it either. And I think 
asking other folks to do that, I, I, I can't, I, I feel like I can't do it because of, of that reality. And, you know, thankfully, um, I have had a great support team, right? I've had, I literally said, like, I hadn't been around this many lawyers since, like, law school, right? Like, once I started whistleblowing, <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh, I have so many lawyers, um, <laughs> right? Like, but having support teams, having people advising you, having people, you know, more than one person advising you so that you have differences of opinion, being able to tell you what risk factors to take, I think having family, having friends is incredibly important to be able to literally get your mind off it. How do you not burn out? You do. It's just the reality. You burn out, and then you ask yourself, is it worth it? Am I going to keep doing it? And I've had to do that so many different times and I, I'm i here, I keep saying yes, so. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it's a less lonely road for people that are doing it now with people like you that are sharing your story and are offering yourself as a resource to talk through what you need to know before you take that step. I hope so. All right, well with that, I hope you guys will join me in thanking Anika and Netta for this awesome conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we'll have a couple more speaker series events throughout the semester. We've published three already and more are in the works. And also just want to highlight an awesome trust and safety in the majority world workshop that Nada is organizing, which will hopefully continue some of these conversations um, in April. So please apply to participate in that. All right.